Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you for joining us today for this crucial presentation. My name is Liv, and I am part of the Australian National Department of Young Scholarly Researchers. Today, I am joined by my fellow experts, Will, Rashi, Jack, and Lucas. Throughout this presentation, we will take you through a walkthrough, um, an in-depth analysis of the trading potentials of Germany. Will, an expert in the effects of globalization, will share his insights in this area. Our next panel members, Rashi and Jack, will present an assessment of the German economic and human development. Uh, myself, I will be our fourth panelist, which will, uh, pro will explore the cultural theories and frameworks of Germany and how they intertwine with those in Australia. And finally, we will conclude our presentation with Lucas, who will provide insights into which German industries uh, Australia should specialise in. We greatly appreciate you for your time today and hope that the conclusion of this presentation you will feel informed and assured in your decision to expand into countries such as Germany. So Will, from a professional standpoint, can you share a little bit about your insights into the effect of globalisation and what this has had on Germany? So what actually is globalisation? Sure Liv, globalisation is a complex term that has developed over time and has many different definitions. However, at its most basic level, globalisation refers to the intensification of worldwide social relations which link economies in such a way that local happenings are shaped by events occurring many miles away. Globalisation integrates human systems including economies, political entities, cultures, languages and technologies. The economic perspective of globalization can be divided into two main components. Firstly, we have the globalization of markets. As technology continually improves, the drive for freer and more global markets results in the world coming closer together. The pressure of increased competition within economies and companies across the world has been a catalyst for increased economic efficiency. Therefore, communication has increased, initiating trade among little local and national markets to form one big international platform. Secondly, the globalization of production implies that businesses can produce their products in other nations. For example, the international dimension of outsourcing has been drawing attention at a political standpoint as Northern firms are, out, um, are offshoring their production to Southern countries. Offshoring allows firms to utilize lower wages in specific countries, ultimately reducing production costs. So what are the drivers behind globalization? The drivers of globalization can be split into two parts. Te technological drivers occur where innovative communication technologies, such as phones, linked economies together. Furthermore, the improvement in transportation technology has initiated trade to occur between suppliers and products from all over the world. The second driver of globalization relates to costs. Costs can vary from country to country and therefore links, the, links to the globalization of production. This encourages countries to utilize international economies and reduce their production costs. So Will, do you reckon you could explain how globalization has affected Germany? Firstly, international trade made it possible for developed countries in Europe to exchange knowledge and products. This forced many countries to reduce trade and barriers, trade barriers and domestic reforms leading to more open borders. Hence, the reduction in barriers to trade and foreign investment led to an opening of new markets by multinational firms. This is where businesses entered into contracts with countries such as Germany to source their products and adopt their services. In recent times, Germany's GDP has taken a hit due to the COVID-19 situation. However, the overall trend highlights the benefits of international trade as Germany's GDP has risen from 2,445 billion euros in 2009 to 3,332 billion euros in 2020. Secondly, globalization enables enterprises to develop new business models and offerings. The introduction of global trade has caused sales to rise exponentially. Therefore, German products have become accessible to more customers and Germany is able to specialise in specific industries. Often in advanced economies, we see a highly skilled workforce. However, an ever-changing work climate has affected Germany as there is a lack of skilled workers. Whilst Germany passed a law that made it easier for foreign workers to become employed, the low supply of labour and high demand for skilled workers has led to excessively high wage demands. So as an Australian firm exploring the potential of Germany, the poor conditions of hiring skilled employees is not sustainable. Furthermore, Germany offshores low-skilled labour, such as those in the service centre industry. Labour in southern countries is cheaper. 
However, this, um, this creates inequality within German society as low-skilled workers suffer from a lack of protection and unemployment benefits. Therefore, Germany is posed with the possibility of losing its middle class. As the rich get richer and the poor become poorer, Australian firms need to evaluate their products and whether they are affordable to all social classes. So, is Germany a winner or a loser as a result of globalisation? Germany is definitely a winner of globalisation as the benefits of trade outweigh the cost of low-skilled labour. Increases in living standards and reduced product prices positively influence customers to spend in the economy. However, an Australian firm would struggle to expand into Germany as high-skilled labour is expensive and the offshoring of labour leads to greater wage inequality. Thanks for the insight, Will. Now on to our second panellist, Rashi, who has vast knowledge on the economy in countries across the world. So when it comes to places like Germany, what type of economic system does Germany have? Germany has a mixed economic system in which certain aspects of the economy are left to private ownership, while other sectors have centralised economic planning and government regulation. And tell me about the gross national income of the country. Has it recovered from the pandemic? Well, according to the World Bank, the GNI Triple P is the gross national income converted to international dollars using purchasing power parity rates, which for Germany was approximately 4.806 trillion Triple P dollars as of 2019. Due to the world undergoing the COVID-19 pandemic, which put economies at a halt, this resulted in a GNI triple P of 4.36 trillion PPP dollars, which was 4.926 decrease from the previous year. However, the country has employed and boosted a stimulus package to assist its economy. The stimulus consists of wage subsidies along with grants to companies. As well as this, according to the Wall Street Journal, Germany experienced a faster than expected recovery compared to other nations. As they, choose, as they chose to keep factories and offices open during the lockdown. As well as making a comeback since the pandemic, Germany was impacted by the worldwide economic crisis of the global financial crisis where the official GDP declined by 5% in 2009, as well as unemployment increasing. In 2010, a growth of 1% of the GDP was expected. However, the un unemployment further increased. To overcome such difficulties, the German government declared a large risk rescue package worth 500 billion euros for the banking and insurance sector, which was severely impacted by the crisis. The bailout, which was in, endorsed by the cabinet, is considered, by the, considered to be the largest state intervention in the German economy since the end of the Second World War. And what are some of the factors which have driven economic growth in Germany? Some of the factors which have contributed to, to German economic development, which is the fifth largest economy in the world and the largest within Euro-Asia, is its high export levels. Its top exports for 2020 were cars, medication, mixes and dosage, automotive parts and accessories, which accounted for 21% of overall export sales. This percentage implies that the country exports a, div a diverse range of goods. As well as this, the global economic revival in 2021, which was driven by the US and China, prompted a further boost in the German economy as the nation exported goods valued at 118.7 billion euros and Im imported goods valued at 102.4 billion euros. Another factor which has driven economic growth within the nation is unemployment, sorry, which is employment, which according to the German Federal Employment Agency, unemployment rates have fallen 5.6% as of July 2021 and already below the pre-crisis rate. The unemployment continues to weigh heavily on the, the unemployment rate is set to decline as 2021 progresses due to the shortage of skilled labour, which continues to weigh heavily on the labour market. The unemployment levels within Germany have been moderate compared to other nations, which is due to employers making use of short-term programs as well as government subsidies. One of the final drivers of economic growth is private consumption and investment, specifically a rise in inflation rates, which was a 3.8% increase according to the German Federal Statistical Office. The rise in inflation in July 2021 was a result of reduction in value-added tax, known as VAT, which is our equivalent of GST from COVID, as well as a reduction in prices of goods and services. Inflation is driven by three factors. Firstly, VAT, which is now the rate it was prior to being reduced for six months at 19%. Secondly, a carbon tax has been introduced as of this year in which 25 euros per tonne of carbon dioxide is levied on emissions of diesel, petrol and heating oil, resulting in an increased price. Lastly, global demand as well as private consumption is pushing prices to increase. So Jack, what do you know about the human development of Germany? 
Uh, HDI, or Human Development Index, is a measure of a country's human development, which was created in 1990. The Human Development Index consists of three major factors. The first factor is life expectancy, or the average lifespan of a person at their time of birth. Next is access to education, measured by the average years spent in education in a given country. Finally is income per capita, referring to the average income made per person within a country. The HDI is ranked on a scale of 0 to 1 with the most developed countries scoring close to one and the least developed countries scoring nearer to zero. However, it must be stated that the lowest HDI currently is 0 0.394. Hence, the human development index must not be treated as an evenly distributed number line. Um, as of 2020, Germany had an HDI of 0 0.947 making it the sixth most developed country in the world behind Norway, Republic of Ireland, Switzerland, Hong Kong, and Iceland. Germany has a life expectancy of 81.3 years, which is the 26th highest in the world. Germany's income per capita is the 17th highest in the world at 55,314 US dollars. However, what sets Germany apart from the rest of the world is its mean years of schooling, which is the highest in the world at 14.2 years. It is clear that Germany has a very high level of human development in comparison to, to, to other countries across the world. So with that in mind, should an Australian firm be more wary of Germany's economic or human development when expanding their businesses into the country? When expanding into Germany, an Australian firm must have a magnified concern for Germany's economic development. Expanding into Germany would pose some unexpected costs for an Australian firm, including the aforementioned value-added tax rate of 19%. Moreover, Germany has a carbon tax in place, meaning that any pet petrol, diesel or heating oil used by the Australian firm will be levied at a rate of 25 euros per tonne of CO2 produced. It is evident that an expansion into Germany would result in an Australian firm incurring more taxes. Hence, Germany's economic development must be closely examined by an Australian firm before ent entering the market. So Liv, can you tell us about the cultural distance between Australia and Germany? Absolutely. So it's really important that we determine what culture is first. Culture is the knowledge and behaviour that characterises a particular group of people. And the theory that we're going to be using to actually analyse this difference is Hofstede's cultural dimensions. This is created by Gerd Hofstede and it analyses cross-cultural communication. And there's six different areas of this. There was four that he started with and then there was an evaluation that was done later on and added two more. So the first one we're going to look at is power distance. Australia gets 38 and Germany 35 on this scale. These countries sit pretty similarly on this. They have a really strong middle class and a hierarchy. They have a general respect between the levels of society and they believe inequality should be pretty minimal. We then move on to individualism. Australia gets a 90 and Germany a 67. There is quite a large difference between these two countries on this scale. Australians have really high levels of individualism and have a general level of respect for uniqueness. Germany does have high levels of individualism, but not quite as drastically high as Australia. We then move on to masculinity versus femininity. Australia gets a 61 and Germany a 66. There is some criticisms around masculinity versus femininity, and we will discuss this a little bit later on. But when we look at a masculine society, this is one that values uh, things such as heroism, achievement, assertiveness, and uh, material reward. When we look at a feminine society, we're looking at things such as cooperation, modesty, caring for the weak, and quality of life. Both countries sit pretty similarly on this scale, but Germany is a touch higher. Australians strive to be the best and have this sort of mindset. Uh, Germans separate students at quite a young age and their status is thrown, shown through materialistic items. We then move on to uncertainty avoidance. Australia gets a 51 and Germany a 65. It appears when looking at uncertainty avoidance, Germany is higher on this scale, leaning more towards stricter rules and structures of life and have less of a tolerance for unorthodox behaviours, whereas Australians don't lean either way particularly. They have rules and have respect for them, but these don't necessarily dictate their ways of life. We then move on to long-term orientation versus short-term. Australia gets a 21 and Germany an 83. These countries sit on vastly opposite ends of the spectrum. Germany receives a really high rating, indicating that this is a pretty pragmatic country that thinks that truth is greatly reliant on situation, context and time, and that traditions can be changed uh, to adapt to new circumstances to keep them running. Australia, on the other hand, gets a pretty low score, indicating that it uh, has a value on on of obtaining rapid outcomes. We finally move on to indulgence. Australia gets a 71 and Germany a 40. 
Again, these countries sit quite far apart, but not as much as the previous. Australia tends to lean towards being quite an indulgent country and has an emphasis on enjoying life and remaining optimistic, while Germans tend to lean towards being a little bit more hesitant on leisure and are restrained by social norms. As I mentioned before, there is quite a few criticisms of these cultural dimensions, um, and I'm going to go through these now. The first one we need to note is that this study was done on one group of people. While it was an international study, it was done on IBM, which was the company that Hofstede worked for. Uh, similar companies, uh, the people that work in them have similar values and they all form biases. So this is something that does need to be considered when looking at the results of this. Uh, these cultural dimensions do not consider the differences that occur within a country uh, between different regions, and it also doesn't uh, cater for individual differences that a person may have towards their country. And as I mentioned before, masculine versus feminine. Uh, in our quite progressive society today, we have a different understanding of what gender actually means. And uh, rather than looking at something as strictly masculine or strictly feminine, we should look at it as something more of what the values of each of these are holding. So Liv, ultimately, are the cultures of the two countries becoming more similar or disparate? Uh, capitalism and international trade, in my opinion, are drawing both countries closer together. There is a greater interchange of cultural ways of thinking. Both Australia and Germany are moving closer to adopting the same Western mindset. Given that, what, can, what industries should Germany focus on? Germany should focus on their automobile manufacturing. But before I dive into that, we need to analyze the arguments of a certain British economist named David Ricardo. David Ricardo argued that a nation what a nation specializes in should be their primary focus for exporting these goods to other nations. And what they don't um, produce as well should be imported from other countries. Germany's manufacturing prowess focuses on the automotive industry and has produced several car companies often associated with high quality and quality service such as Audi, Porsche, BMW, or, and Volkswagen to name a few. Automobiles are therefore associated with Germany because of their quality and timeliness to deliver. German engineering gave them the reputation of one of the best automobile manufacturers in the world. Not the cheapest, but to give products of quality. Specializing in goods that the nation is proficient in allows them to continue further research and development into these respective industries. To keep them um, in furthering their endeavors, the German auto research and development divisions need to cut some corners and therefore the automobile industry prefers to work with universities because automobile suppliers can enhance their in-house capacities and use their automobile specific potentials more efficiently. The sacrifice of quality, however, keeps them ahead of, or not quality, but it does keep them ahead of global competition. Germany should focus on its automobile industry as its primary produced um, consumer good. Bringing it a little back to Australia, with the closure of Holden Manufacturing, space and a lot of the competition has cleared up for German automobile companies to move into the Australian manufacturing market. However, German automobile companies must be aware that its competitors, especially China, are looking to enter the market as well. Therefore, Germany should focus on what they're good at manufacturing, which is their automobiles. So what industry should Australia focus on then? Australia's most notable exportable industry is mining. Mining has contributed $128.3 billion in 2021 so far, according to the IBIS World Report, making it the seventh largest industry in the country. Its access to rare earth minerals like uranium and gold, along with aluminum and iron, make it some of the world's largest sources for these minerals and ores. Not only does Australia have mines in its own country, but it operates several smaller firms in other countries that fall under its business umbrella, such as companies in the Philippines. Through joint ventures and subcontracting agreements that share resources and profits, the Australian mining industry is supported and financed heavily by the Australian government. Its prowess and relevance has surpassed that of needing to mine within its own borders and has decided to take on several operations overseas. Thank you so much for that, Lucas. Now, over the next couple of slides, if you want to pause this presentation, we really encourage you to do so and have a look at our resources that we've provided. I would also like to thank our panel members today, Will, Rashi, Jack and Lucas. Thank you for your expertise and insights today. We hope that this information has provided clarity in your decision and ensured that Germany is the right country for you to expand into. Thank you.